Congratulations, you've made it to day four. What I'd like to do today is continue our conversation about basic shapes. On day one, we talked about drawing lightly. On day two, you were introduced to circles and ovals. On day three, you were introduced to straight edge shapes. And today, we're going to continue our conversation about how to construct forms using shapes, but we're going to talk again about curved shapes. We started off with basic circles and ovals, and again, those are very foundational forms. What we're gonna do today is take those shapes and start to play with them, to bend them, to stretch them, to come up with a number of different kinds of rounded forms that are gonna be much more useful when we start trying to draw objects. Now, you may have noticed that we're most of the way through week one and we haven't actually tried to draw anything yet. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why that is. So many people, when they start off drawing, jump in too quickly trying to draw subjects. And oftentimes, they're subjects that are way beyond what a beginner should try. And that's a really great way to start to develop bad habits. So instead of doing that, what I'm trying to do is just introduce you to the mechanics of how drawing works and some of the basic concepts. You'll notice that tomorrow, when we actually start trying to draw a subject, you'll be very comfortable working with these shapes, working with evaluating angles, and just thinking through this process. When I ask you to place an oval at a certain angle, you won't struggle with it. It'll come much easier since we've spent some time dealing with this subject on its own without trying to draw anything. I really want to congratulate you on the investment in time you've made learning some of the basic fundamentals of drawing before jumping in and trying to draw actual objects. It's an invaluable investment and it'll stop you from making many mistakes and developing many bad habits down the road. Now today is called charting the course of curves and what we're going to do is revisit rounded lines and shapes to really figure out how they work and to make some shapes that go well beyond basic circles and ovals. The reason we're focusing on this for an entire day is because you'll notice that there are many parts of a drawing that don't easily fall into a recognizable shape. Usually what we need to do is to evaluate those as lines. Now, human beings are very good at looking at angles and being able to discern differences even between subtle differences in diagonals. But we're less good at looking at a curve and doing that. So the whole concept that we're going to be focusing on today is how to translate curved lines and rounded shapes into angles. There are many different ways we can use straight lines and angles to evaluate curved lines and rounded shapes. Let's begin with a familiar shape, the oval. On day two, we talked about ovals being oriented either horizontally or vertically. To illustrate this further, let's imagine a line following the long axis of the oval. This gives us a perfectly vertical line showing that this oval is on a vertical axis. There are as many angles of axis lines as there are angles. Here's an oval at a horizontal axis, a 45 degree axis, and numerous others. Regardless of how opened or closed an oval is, it will have its own axis. It's important to know that the axis line also acts as a line of symmetry dividing the oval into two halves. Each of these halves should mirror each other. While you're drawing your ovals, this is an important thing to keep in mind. If you find that, after you draw an axis line in your ovals, that the two sides are different, try and correct for this in your practice. In this piece by Eva Gonzalez, we can clearly see one oval and one partial oval at a horizontal axis. When ovals are used to indicate a circle going into perspective, as is the case in the circular opening of a bowl, they are called ellipses. We'll talk more about ellipses in week 4 of the Art and Science of Drawing. In this piece by Daumier, we can see a number of ovals and partial ovals on slanted axes. Once again, we can see that these shapes are not drawn perfectly, but they do a wonderful job at giving us the idea. Whenever you come across a complex curve, such as this line shown here, it can be much easier to observe and evaluate if you first break it down into angles. There are two main ways in which this can be done. First, let's take a look at where the line begins and where it ends. Apart from the curved line connecting them, 
try and visualize the straight angle that connects both of these points. Before you draw any complex curve, it's important to know the exact angle between where it begins and where it ends. The second way to use angles to evaluate a complex curve is to break the curve down into the fewest number of angles. In this overlay, you can see how easily a curve can be translated into angles. Here we have the two main angles of the curve. Next, we can use angles to simplify the curves at the beginning and the end of the line. Finally, by adding in only three more angles, we're able to fully describe the curve. By breaking complex curves down into simple angles, they become much less abstract and much more structured and easy to understand. This illustration of a flamingo does an excellent job of illustrating these two elements together. The simplified shapes of both the body and the head are ovals. Each of them is a different size, a different level of openness, and has a different axis. The neck of the flamingo winds its way down from the body toward the head in a winding complex curve. But despite all of its subtle curvatures, it easily simplifies into just a few large angles. Take a look again without the overlay. Hopefully, you're beginning to see complex forms like this one as a series of basic shapes and angles. Often when students see a complex curve such as this one, they'll draw a loose approximation, often stating that they don't think curves are as specific as angles. In actuality, curves can be just as precise as angles. The other thing I often see that I would like you to avoid is drawing by using these sketchy staccato lines. Think about line quality in the same way you think of tone of voice. We respond better to confident and dynamic mark making. Sketchy lines tend to communicate a timidness or nervousness. I'm not in the habit of pointing out things I don't want you to do, but I see this often enough in the studio that I think it's important that I call it out specifically. Here's a much better way to properly analyze and draw a complex curve. The first thing I'm going to do is figure out where the line should start and where the line should stop. Again, there is a specific distance and directional relationship between the start and stop of any curved line. Once you're confident about the placement of the beginning and end of the line, you can start analyzing the curve. Here you'll see me making a first attempt at the direction the line is moving at its starting point and stopping point. Again, note that I'm drawing an angle, not a curve yet. As I search for the best placement and angle of the next part of the line, you'll see me constantly referring back to the point I've already drawn. I've now translated each end of the curve into two angles. Notice that the top section of the line I'm copying is a bit more curved than the bottom section, to account for this more extreme bowing of the top curve of the line, I'm going to add a third angle. Now I'll try for the larger angles in the center of the curve. Note that this is a very different method than just starting at the beginning of the curve and following it all the way down until I get to the end. By addressing both ends simultaneously, I'm able to get a much better sense of how the curve is moving. As I continue translating the curve into angles, Notice how many times I evaluate and change things. Remember, drawing is a process that contains many iterations. You should always feel comfortable reevaluating what you've drawn and making any necessary changes. It's important to note that there is no single solution to translating any curve into angles. We could reduce the number of angles or increase them. But the idea here is that it provides a structured way for you to think about curves, which can otherwise be a little wily and hard to manage. Once I'm satisfied that I found a solution, now I can go over and darken the line. The metaphor I'm using here is that the angles provide a scaffolding for the curved roller coaster track to go over later. We'll talk more about how to darken your lines tomorrow. But for now, this is a great illustration of the drawing process. The drawing starts lightly, goes through multiple iterations, and once you're pleased with the form, then you darken only the lines you want a viewer to see, confident that you've laid a solid foundation. Once again, we're not going for perfection, but hopefully you can see how close this process has gotten us to the original line.
Eggs are some of my very favorite shapes to draw, and they're essential for you to learn if you want to do any figure drawing or animal drawing. An egg is an ovoid shape that is wider at one end and narrower at the other. Just like an oval, every egg has an axis. Eggs come in many shapes and sizes and are among some of the most versatile organic forms. Although there is no one right way to draw an egg, the method I prefer is to start each egg by drawing a circle. Next, I will rock my hand back and forth across the top, once again pantomiming to see what kind of line is going to come out of it, and once I'm satisfied, tip the pencil down. Just like you practice with ovals, you should get used to drawing eggs at many different angles. And again, like ovals, your axis line should act as a line of symmetry. By drawing an axis line through the center, you can evaluate each side of your egg to make sure they're the same. Being able to place the axis first is a critical skill to have once you start drawing subjects. Once you've determined and drawn the axis, next draw the circle, making sure that each side mirrors the other. Finally, rock your hand back and forth and construct the top of the egg. You'll also want to get comfortable varying the proportion of the egg, making them bigger, smaller, wider, or narrower. You might find it easier to draw the circle for the egg first and add the axis line afterwards. It can be easier to place an axis line at the center of a circle rather than to draw an axis first and place the circle properly on the axis. Not all eggs have a circular base. In this egg, you'll see me making the motion of a circle but only drawing part of it. Next, I'll rock my hand back and forth to construct an egg that is much flatter and wider at one end. Part of your practice today is going to be to experiment drawing different shapes and sizes of eggs. Remember, there's no one right way to draw. It's up to you to experiment and figure out what works best for you. The last kinds of shapes we're going to talk about today are bent shapes. On day two, you learned how to construct shapes using straight lines, like rectangles. What I'm going to demonstrate now is what happens if we bent a rectangle. As you'll see, a bent rectangle has two straight sides, but also two curving sides. One of the important things to remember while you're constructing these kinds of shapes is to keep your lines fluid. Try not to revert back to any previous ways of drawing you had. Keep drawing from your full arm using large fluid motions. Also on day two, you learned how to construct various different kinds of triangles. Triangles can also be bent. There are, of course, an infinite number of variations on bent rectangles and bent triangles. Keep in mind that a single bent rectangle or triangle can bend multiple times. Part of your practice today will be to explore and invent these kinds of shapes. Ovals and eggs can be bent as well. First, I'm just going to draw a traditional oval with a horizontal axis. Note that the axis line does act as a line of symmetry, where both sides of the oval, top and bottom, are mirroring one another. If we bent this oval, we might get a shape that looks something like this. Keep in mind that if you bend an oval, the axis line has to bend as well. A bent axis line like this is often referred to as a shape's gesture. Gesture drawing is a concept that is relied heavily on for figure drawing. The idea is that you can establish the direction and dynamism of a curved form before attempting to draw the contours of the form itself. A line of gesture is often, but not always, in the center of the form. Sometimes they appear as center lines, and other times they establish the edge of the form. Here you'll see me starting with a gesture line and then constructing the shape around it. A curved axis line, or gesture, 
isn't quite as specific as a straight axis line, but it does a great job at describing the movement of the shape. Here you'll see me constructing a traditional egg shape. Once again note that I'm starting with a circle at the bottom and rocking the top back and forth. If we bend an egg shape though, notice how this changes both the shape and how I'm drawing it. The complex curve means I can't rely solely on circle drawing or rocking my hand back and forth. Again, watch the speed and the way the pencil moves while I'm drawing these shapes. Remember, you want to get in the habit of drawing fluidly and confidently. Pushed far enough, these kinds of bent egg shapes often start to resemble gourds, eggplants, or other kinds of organic forms. Once again, these forms are critical for you to learn if you want to do any sort of figure drawing or animal drawing. Today, your practice is going to consist of three different projects. First, on one side of a sheet of paper, draw a curve line. Don't overthink it, any curve line will do. Right next to it, on the same sheet of paper, try analyzing and drawing this form exactly as you see it by breaking it down into its basic angles. Remember, we're not going for perfection, we're just gaining experience through practice. The more you do projects like these, the better you will get at them. Once you've analyzed and copied at least one curved line, try the same project with a bending shape such as an oval or an egg. You can use the same strategy of turning curves into angles to draw shape as well. Finally, draw 100 freestyle forms using light, fluid lines. These forms can be anything that we've talked about so far, circles, ovals, quadrilaterals, or combinations of shapes. A great way to experiment is to start off with a shape like an egg and stretch it, bend it, and distort it in various ways. You can make shapes with both straight lines and curved lines. There are no rules here. The goal is just to get some experience drawing a wide range of different kinds of shapes using light, fluid lines. Now today is our last day of working with basic shapes. Tomorrow, you're going to learn how to turn these basic shapes into recognizable forms. Now remember, I'm giving you the minimum amount of practice, but if you want to get really good at this, try doubling or tripling the amount you're practicing. The more you're able to practice these concepts and tools, the better you're going to get. I look forward to seeing you on day five, where we're going to put all of these tools and concepts together in order to draw recognizable forms. Have a great time practicing, and I'll see you tomorrow.